here. And uh, I'm gonna, I'm, I guess in, in the title of this, you have non equilibrium statistical physics and applications. I guess I'm going to fill in on the applications. I'm going to tell you things that you, uh, some physics that you haven't seen before related to spins. So, um, as you can see, I have nano in the title, nano magnets. So the approach is a little different than, than the statistical physics. Is the, the idea is that we have a system which has some limited number of degrees of freedom. It's composed of some hundreds, millions, billions of atoms. And we want to find basically the interactions which help us describe those systems. And uh, the hope is that because we have a limited number of degrees of freedom, we can understand the interactions in the systems and, and, and characterize them. So I mentioned at the beginning I'm an experimentalist. So we're looking for experimental systems. And this first lecture, I'm going to tell you about, uh, sort of set the scene for the later lectures. I'll tell you about magnetic interactions and classical magnetization dynamics. And the second lecture, I'll tell you about a new interaction bet between currents and magnetization, uh, which was discovered in 1996, which is now being <coughs> observed in an experiment. And then the third lecture, I'll tell you about quantum spin dynamics, uh, systems in which quantum fluctuations play a very important role in the uh, dynamics. So let me start with kind of a broad overview of, of what nanomagnetism is. Um, we're talking about a small uh, system with some number of atoms that are coupled, typically ferromagnetically, that form uh, a bigger magnetic moment. Um, and these are, are things that are on the scale of hundreds of nanometers down to the atomic scale. Um, and they're, they're very important systems uh, for uh, physics and for applications. I guess there's a huge community of people working on these problems because most, a lot of data is stored in magnetic materials. In fact, today, the densest way of storing information is in magnetic materials, and therefore the questions that you heard in the last lecture, the questions of metastability uh, and stability and time scales are absolutely critical. You have a system which has intrinsic <coughs> dynamics on the nanosecond time scale, yet you'd like the magnetization to be stable for years, tens of years, as long as you want to maintain information in, the, in that magnetic uh, system. So these are the kinds of things one would like to understand, and these are the kind of things one can experiment with. Uh, one can experiment with lithographically prepared elements. One can start with thin films and then cut them up using modern lithographic tools like electron beam lithography and high milling and end up with things on the 100 nanometer scale. And you can also start on the other end, uh, start with um, systems which are, which are uh, synthesized chemically, which are molecules that consist of tens to hundreds of magnetic centers. Uh, and that lets you span a range of sizes from anywhere from 20 atoms, 20 magnetic four magnetons up to 10 to the sixth, to billions of, of magnetic uh, centers. And so there's, there's very interesting physics in, this, in, this, in these systems. Uh, what we've learned recently is that you can, if you pass a current directly through an itinerant ferromagnet, like cobalt, nickel, or iron, you can excite magnetization dynamics. And that magnetization dynamics isn't, isn't associated with the fields produced by the current, but by the flow of spin angular momentum that's going through the system. So I'll talk about that in, my, in the second lecture. Uh, and on a very small scale, you have a situation where you can have metastability, a system that can point either up or down along a particular axis, and you can have thermal fluctuations, but you can also have quantum fluctuations that cause the magnetization to reverse. And these sorts of molecules are beautiful systems in which to study the interplay between the quantum fluctuations and the um, and thermal fluctuations. And in between, I've drawn some nanoparticles that are being synthesized. These are chemically synthesized systems. They're systems that are candidates for the next generations of, of magnetic hard drives where people are trying to push to get have terabytes per square inch kinds of data storage. With the idea that you have very small particles that have very stable magnetization directions, and you go in and you magnetize these particles individually, and they would maintain their state until you, until you want to change that, that magnetization. So these are the kinds of systems that people people look at. So let me start. I'm going to start. This is an outline of the lecture. I'm going to start with some of the interactions that are important in, the, in, the, in magnetic materials: uh, exchange, uh, isotropy, dipole interactions, some things you probably know about. 
Uh, Zane, I'll tell you about uh, the micromagnetic energy, how you describe a system uh, classically, say, uh, and, and the resulting energy field and length scales that come out. And I'll give you some examples of, of magnetic domain structures that, that, that are seen uh, in, in magnetic materials to give you an idea of the kinds of ground states or metastable states you find in these systems. And then I'll talk in the second part about magnetic nanostructures, uh, in particular, a, a kind of idealized model, something called the single domain model, which is where you reduce all that collection of spins down to uh, one or two degrees of freedom, just the angle of magnetization, and that's what is the dynamics. Uh, and I'll show you that actually there have been experiments uh, in the last 10 years, 15 years, in which, uh, which you can measure a single nanomagnet, and that is thermally driven reversal. Uh, and I'll talk briefly about this quantum classical uh, transition. And then I'll show you, I'll discuss how you describe magnetization dynamics uh, classically, how we look at the excitations of the magnetization, what are the equations of motion. Uh, I'll give you some references at the end. Okay, some basic things. Um, okay, the most important interaction in the magnetic material is the exchange interaction. Uh, this arises from Coulomb interactions between electrons and the Pauli exclusion principle. This is a, a spin independent interaction can give you this, give you this very, very strong interaction. And the scale of that interaction can be on the scale of the melting temperature of solids. And that's what gives you ferromagnetism, in, it can give you ferromagnetism in, uh, in, in, some, in, in, in certain materials, uh, but these, these kind of interactions. Um, a weaker scale, typically, you have magnetocrystalline anisotropy. And this is associated with spin-orbit interactions. And this gives you a preferred uh, direction for the magnetic moments in space. So exchange just tells the spins they have to lock together in some way. And spin-orbit breaks uh, the symmetry and, and gives a preferred direction. It's usually much orders of magnitude smaller. And finally, you have the magnetic dipole interactions. And you know that magnetic dipole interactions are, are weak, but very, very long range. And this often leads to all the complexity you see in ferromagnetic materials. Unfortunately, you can't go in and turn it off very easily, but you can find systems, say, where these, these interactions are not as important. But it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's an interaction that depends not the, on the spin and the relative separation between atomic sites, so it can lead to interesting situations preferring either ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic correlations depending on the relative a position of two, of two sites. So these are the, a rough, roughly the scale exchange, magnetic crystal and magnetic dipole interactions uh, that we have to deal with in, in materials. Um, so if we go a little bit further, uh, if you, this is the Heisenberg Hamiltonian. So this is an effective interaction between spins that we can write as the uh, spin operator on side I times the spin operator spin operator on site J. So uh, this is a, this is a, okay, if J is less than, than zero negative, you, you get ferromagnetic in, interactions. And, uh, and this is the situation I'm mainly going to discuss cases where you have ferromagnetism. In a continuum description, you, you can write the interaction as follows in terms of the gradient of the magnetization uh, square. So this is a, Often this interaction is strong enough in a material that the spin, so not the spin directions aren't going to vary on the scale of the lattice constant. So a continuum description uh, makes sense. And uh, Tc is, is the ordering temperature is set by the scale of the exchange interactions. Uh, so uh, then next down you have anisotropy. And first, this is a simple case where you just imagine you have an easy a plane or an easy axis anisotropy, which you can write in terms of the projection of the uh, spin on the uh, z-axis. So if d is greater than zero, you have an easy axis type anisotropy. The spin wants to point either up or down along the along an easy axis. And if d is less than zero, you have a, a easy plane anisotropy. So the, uh, the spin will, uh, will live in the xy plane. So classically, you can write this as just a constant times the, the uh, component of the magnetization along uh, the z-axis. So you can think about an energy surface like this, where the energy is minimum when the magnetization is along plus z or, or minus z. 
So all would be fine here if we just had these two interactions. We could satisfy everything. We could have the spins aligned and in a particular direction, and there would be little complexity to magnetic materials. What adds complexity is interactions, these long-range interactions, dipole interactions. Um, and the, the microscopic form of these interactions is as follows. It depends on the, on the magnetic moment and the uh, vector joining the two uh, spin sites, the, the Rijs. And so uh, you have a situation here where the spins, if they're, uh, if they're, if they're, if they're perpendicular to the line joining uh, the, their sites, you prefer to be anti-aligned. And yet the spins, if they're aligned along the <coughs> line of their okay, these vectors, uh, would prefer to be ferromagnetically aligned. So this is a microscopic, and you can think of this as some kind of shape anisotropy. Uh, the, spin, the, the lattice will determine, uh, the, and the shape of the sample will determine uh, the resulting uh, low energy uh, states. Um, so this, these, these three interactions together ha cannot be easily satisfied, except in slow special situations. And in terms of a continuum description, we write this in terms of magnetostatic energy, um, where the magnetization generates uh, dipole magnetic fields, where this is the uh, demagnetization tensor. Um, and you can write the energy density either in terms of the uh, demagnetization fields times the um, time dotted into the magnetization, or you can just integrate the magnetization overall space to determine the total uh, magnetostatic energy. So this is, these are the, the minimum ingredients you would need to describe a ferromagnet. There are many other ingredients that might come in. There's interactions between the lattice. And there's magnetoelastic interactions. So if you, if you have strain and so on, that, can, that comes in. So these are just the minimal set, the simplest things you can imagine. Um, you can also imagine anisotropies that are, that are associated with whether the atoms are on the surface or in the bulk, uh, etc. Okay, and finally you have the Zeeman interaction. So you can apply a magnetic field and give a preferred direction uh, to the spins, which would be along uh, the, the field direction or a magnetization line with, with the field direction. Um, so these are the things that we have to work with when we're dealing with magnetic materials. This competition between these various energies. Uh, there are a number of situations where the magnetostatic energy can be simplified, where it can where you can think about it in terms of a local, a local interaction. In this case, you can hope to do analytic uh, theories. Uh, for example, you could, if you can write the demagnetization energy just like an, an isotropy, just as a constant, uh, times uh, the magnetization, uh, some magnetization component, uh, then, you can, uh, then, you can, you can, then you have another, just another anisotropy in the problem. And, and that's something uh, that can sometimes be, sometimes you can find kind of exact solutions for, for magnetization reversal. These are some of the simple cases where you, if you have a thin film, a sample which is very thin in say the Z direction, uh, then the preferred direction of magnetization will be easy plane, so it will be in the XY plane. If you have an infinite cylinder, uh, that is the, uh, the, the sample is infinite in the Z direction, uh, the preferred direction will be uh, along the Z direction. And if you have a sphere, uh, there's, there's no preferred direction of magnetization. So uh, this, this shows a general property of the demagnetization tensor that the trace of the demagnetization tensor is, is one. So the examples one finds is that if, if you have a uniformly magnetized ellipsoid, then, the, then, you, then, this, then you can write the energy in this way. If you have very, very small single domain particles, so the magnetization is essentially uniform. And it turns out also if you have thin films with in-plane magnetization, under certain approximations, you can write uh, the demagnetization energy as a local <coughs> energy. And in fact, with a collaborator, um, Dan Stein uh, at NYU, uh, we've been able to, to use such an approximation to find the, uh, the metastable states of a thin ring undergoing a magnetization reversal. Um, and uh, this is an, these are some of the pictures of the transition states where you have a, a thin, soft ring which can either be magnetized clockwise or counterclockwise. You can have either a metastable state that's a global rotation of the magnetization at some angle or, or a soliton um, where a localized fluctuation uh, forms at, and then will expand. So that's kind of a neat thing when you have 
is when you can approximate these by local, by local interaction, you can really come up with, with models. But these are, there are very few of these kinds of, of models, actually, uh, in, that, in magnetism. One is the single domain model, uh, and, and then, then there's some others. <laughs> I guess you can count them, basically, the cases where you can get analytic, analytic results. So there are many metastable states? Uh, like, do you think that there's three metastable states? You, um, you can, actually, this is the, uh, this, the there's only one metastable state, but it depends on the magnetic, in this case, it depends on the magnetic field and the size of the ring. But there's only one type. This metastable, this state here cannot, can, can, can nucleate anywhere in the ring, so you have a degeneracy, and, and that actually leads to non erroneous behavior in the universe. So you get a uh, prefactor that, that, uh, it, which, which depends on so that's but the but, but we're just look, this there is just one that has a state state in this this problem. Okay, so we're going to now specialize to the classical case. I'll come back to those quantum expressions uh, later on uh, when I talk about uh, molecular systems, where you can write down a microscopic Hamiltonian for the system and look at the resulting dynamics. Um, so we're talking about a continuum description of, mag of, of, of magnetism. Um, and, uh, and this is the form of the micromagnetic energy. Uh, so you have an exchange term, which wants to penalize radiance of the magnetization. You have an anisotropy term. Again, I've written this in the simplest way. You could have various types of anisotropy. Your, uh, depending on the types of materials you have and, 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 and so on. Um, you have a Zeeman interaction and then you have the magnetostatic uh, interaction. <coughs> so uh, you can formulate the problem and uh, you can, it's also often written in terms of an exchange length here which tells you the importance of exchange relative to the other uh, terms in the problem. It also sets the scale under which you can under which the magnetization varies. But, what are the important length scales? Uh, it's the exchange constant. Uh, the, this is the, the exchange length is a ratio of the exchange to the magnetostatic energy. Another important length scale uh, that comes out is the ratio of the exchange to the anisotropy. This sets the scale of the, domain, of the size of domain walls in your, in your problem. So on what scale can spins rotate and reorient? Uh, if the anisotropy is very large, that occurs on a very long length scale. If the anisotropy is very, 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 uh, very I'm sorry, if the anisotropy is very small, that occurs on a long length scale. Um, and if the anisotropy is very uh, large, you, can, you get very sharp uh, domain structures. And another ratio that you can form is the ratio of the anisotropy to the uh, magnetostatic energy. Uh, and and, and that will tell you how the system decides to, to uh, equilibrate, whether it will either pay an energy penalty of anisotropy. Or, by, or create uh, magnetic, magnetic fields. Um, so this is one way to formulate. There are other ways. This is in terms of magnetostatic uh, potential, where you write uh, your, your magnetostatic limit. You assume that uh, there are no uh, currents or fields generated by the changing uh, magnetization. Um, so you can write H as a gradient of potential. And then you have the boundary conditions on the uh, field, which parallels continuous at any boundary, and the deep perpendicular is also continuous, which gives you uh, this expression. And this, this gives you a way to solve uniquely uh, for the potential, which goes into this uh, expression for the micromagnetic uh, energy. So, we have H and H. Mm -hmm. Oh, so H E is the thank you. Please feel free to ask questions. No, no, they're just, uh, I mean, people talk about, certainly in the context of superconductors, with a special case, for instance, uh, talk about dynamization correction, which, where, you know, you really do not impose HE at the surface of the surface. So this HE is actually an applied external field. But is that what the moments really feel? Uh, the, uh, is that what the moments feel at the surface? I'm separating the field into two components. One is associated with the fields due to the internal fields due to the other dipoles, mm -hmm. and the other is the external field. Okay. So I've lumped all of the internal interactions into this term, and all of the uh, interactions with the external field in, in here. I think that's, that's okay. Right, okay. 
Other questions at this point? So again, what is so H is H uh, E plus M or well, M so or by M. H E is the is the external is the external field without the four pi M without the magnetization. Um, I believe that's correct. Tom can tell me. He's shaking his head. That means he's correct. Okay. <laughs> so I yeah. So uh, the uh, H E is the is, is is the applied field associated with external currents in the in the product. So again, I'm I'm going to talk about materials. So it's important to know what the length scales are for say real materials. If that's allowed here. <laughs> okay, so uh, <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I mean, the, 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 uh, the, 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 I mean for, if you're an experimentalist or even if you're a technologist, uh, there's a, a nice simplification in magnetism. One is that there are only three ferromagnetic elements in the whole periodic table that are based on the transition metals. I mean, there's some rare earths that are almost ferromagnetic, but uh, they're the, the the, the technologically and important and high TC ferromagnets are all based on iron, cobalt, and nickel and alloys of those materials. And there the moments are associated with the partially filled D shells of those elements. Um, so uh, you have uh, a situation where you have a moment associated with the atomic side. Actually, it's more complicated because these are also itinerant ferromagnets, but for the moment you can see that there, there's a net a moment because of because of Hunt's rules, and the exchange scale in these in these magnets is, is a thousand Kelvin. That's about the scale of TC, or it corresponds to an internal field of about 100 Tesla. So it's a huge field. Uh, the next important scale is the anisotropy field. Um, that's on the on the scale of 10 Kelvin, or anywhere from milli Tesla uh, up to 10 Tesla. Uh, a big, in, a big, in, a big, in, a great importance has been in, in the search has been to raise the anisotropy field to make a more stable magnet. And I think this is close to the maximum that's been achieved in the lab is an anisotropy on a scale of uh, uh, 10 millitesla. And this is the dipole interactions between a uh, neighboring spin. It's, its scale is about one Kelvin. That, that doesn't take into effect that there's an interaction that long, that the interaction is long range and which could make it as important as the the anisotropy energy. So if you look at the length scales that come out of this, you find an exchange point that's on the order of four nanometers. So you're talking about about four nanometers, about 20 atoms wide. That's about the scale of which the magnetization can vary in these ferromagnets. Um, so that's many atomic sites. Seems reasonable that a continuum description should apply. And the domain wall width can vary from five to hundreds of nanometers. It's about 50 or 100 nanometers in a, in a soft magnetic material like nickel, nickel iron. So that's that's about the scale of the uh, domain wall. Okay. So these are the these are the uh, interactions. Now, so I'll sh let me show you just first some examples. I mean, not picked entirely randomly, just I had on hand to show you what the comp what this kind of interplay between these interactions can can give you in terms of magnetic structure. So these are some examples of of materials we've worked with uh, over the years. Uh, we, we actually drew, drew this is iron, um, epitaxial iron, so it's a very thin film of 110 iron. Iron is a body centered cubic lattice, and, iron, and the easy directions are along those cube directions. But if you make a 110 material and you make it thin, then in, that, in the plane of the film there's only one easy direction. And that's, so you can make iron, which is uh, cubic, uniaxial. So some approximation. Uh, there's an easy direction then uh, along the 001 uh, and a uh, medium, I guess, direction along 1, one bar 0. Um, so this, uh, this shows that experiments we did. We grew epitaxial films, and then we patterned them into wires. And we, we changed the wire width. And this shows the surface of the, of the films in an STM, uh, where you see atomic steps, um, so plateaus and atomic steps. So very, they're very smooth films. Uh, they're, they're anywhere from uh, 25, we grew them from 13 nanometers up to a few hundred nanometers in thickness. 
And what we've tried to do here is engineer a competition. Because the easy axis of the materials is perpendicular to the wire width, the magnetization has to do something when it comes to the boundary. If it, if it were uniform, you form, you'd have a discontinuity in the magnetization, you'd form, you'd have large magnetic fields outside the sample. So uh, a lower energy state is to form what are called strike domains. So where the magnetization alternates between up and down to get uh, some kind to reduce the magnetic field. So it can reduce the, the magnetic field in two ways. It can reduce it by forming little edge domains so that the, uh, if, these, if these lines are 45 degrees to the, uh, to the magnetization, then the uh, normal component of magnetization is continuous and uh, you minimize the, 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 uh, the magnetic field and you have kind of a closer, closure situation where the magnetic flux is closed. Or if the uh, anisotropy is very, very large, uh, the system can uh, actually larger than the demagnetization field, the system can form stripes without these kind of closure uh, patterns. So the idea here of the experiment was to vary the wire width and to look at the domain patterns and also to study how the domain width and properties depends on the, uh, on the size of the wire. Um, and uh, in this case, if there's a simple theory that says that for large enough widths, the domain size should go as the square root of the width of the wire. So these, these are elements where we can lithographically, like tuning a lithographic dimension, uh, play, with the inter play with these interactions, which the interplay between exchange and isotropy and magnetostatic interactions. And so we had a lot of fun with this, actually. These are magnetic force microscopy images of wires of different width. 2 microns, 5 microns, 20 microns. You're looking down on the wire, and you're looking, the magnetic force microscope essentially is looking at the stray fields emanating from the sample. So there's stray fields at the boundary of the, of the wires where the magnetization is forced to, to come to a surface. And you can see uh, there's light and dark, so south and north, north and south, etc. So you're forming domains and domain walls. And uh, depends actually, the, what the scale of the domains actually depends on how the, what the history of the sample what this history of the sample was. So here's a sample that was saturated first in a large magnetic field transverse to the wire, and this is the same, same sample saturated which it, with a field along the wire axis. So you can see all kinds of interesting things, actually. When, we, when you have these very narrow domains, at 0.4 microns, you can see light and dark contrast in the domain walls, and that corresponds to different chiralities of the wall or the domain wall can, or the spins can circular clockwise or counterclockwise, and that produces uh, different holes, different fields at the surface. And there's a tendency to anti -alter, to alternate to minimize the magnetostatic energy, but sometimes you see a defect here uh, where the magnetic, the chirality of the wall changes sign uh, right in the middle. And so you, and you, you can also, as you go to larger thickness, you actually have uh, larger width, you get refinement of the domain structure, you get spikes of reverse domains penetrating this main phase. Many, much of this has, has been studied, I'd say, from the equilibrium point of view, trying to understand the refinement of domains at the boundary of a ferromagnet. Um, so, but these are really, me these are metastable states, which, which, which are uh, not necessarily easy to, to calculate. Uh, you can also... In yes. picture T, there are these long strides that go through these domains, in picture D, but this is probably some kind of noise in the experiment. This kind of, yeah, we don't believe this is real, I don't, this is some, this doesn't look like real structure and that it, and it, it could be, a, either it's a scratch in the sample where you have some magnetic fields emanating or it's, it's noise in the experiment. Excuse me, just out of curiosity, this is magnetic force microscopy? Yeah, this is magnetic force microscopy. So this is magnetic force microscopy on, of, you know, on these, on these uh, wires at room temperature, just looking at their, their, the states that you have in these samples. Can you define the K and M sub S in the previous Sure, you can try. M sub S is the saturation magnetization. So that's the actual M sub S is the full moment of the material. So it's the magnetization density, it's the maximum magnetization. K is the anisotropy. 
And M is, I mean, I've written these in terms of unit vectors that represent the direction. So those are the direction of magnetization, M vector over S. Okay, so the other, I mean, this is examples. If you make, so this is, if, if the film is thick, this is 100 nanometers uh, thick, the magnetization rotates uh, perpendicular to the plane in the direction of, along the, you know, around a vector in the plane of the wire. If the film is very thin, it's too costly for the magnetization to come out of plane. It rotates in the plane. That's called the Niel Niel domain wall. Uh, or, and, and, and that generates the uh, bulk charges. Uh, and so what the, the, the wall refines to have Niel uh, sections with opposite chirality. So you get a periodicity along the domain wall that reflects, again, the, the system wanting to minimize its magnetic field energy. So you get various intricate micromagnetic structure uh, depending on the uh, on, on dimensions here. So this is very thin. If you go thicker, you saw this image. This is the same kind. This is based, this is the same image. Then if you go even thicker, this is a 200 nanometer film. The system decides well uh, it wants it, it, it can it can it, to expand the domain walls to make the domain walls larger, longer in length to minimize magnetostatic energy. So you have walls that are canted now with different chirality to bring those sections of the wall uh, closer together. It's a very, these are very rich systems, actually. You can play with uh, through, uh, through this kind of lithography in this case. Um, we also did photoelectron emission microscopy. Um, MFM is a technique that, set, that senses magnetic fields. <coughs> Uh, you can also go in and more directly image the magnetic domains by using certain polarized light. Um, we're using what's called the MCD effect, the magnetic circular dichroism. The different uh, domain directions relative to the K vector of light absorb different amounts of light. So you get different numbers of photo emitted electrons depending on the magnetization direction relative to the K vector of the light. And so this is a, a more of an internal probe of the magnetization. And again, you see these striped domains. Um, and this is a comparison to our MFM images. And interestingly, there's very little evidence of those little closure domains in the human image. We never really understood that. It's the resolution of the peak compared to the MFM. So the yeah, peak now, they're pushing the peak. The MFM is, is on, on the scale of, say, 20 to 50 nanometer resolution. It depends on how fine a tip you can create. The PEAM is now getting probably close to below 10 nanometers, I would suspect. They've been put, at this point, when we did these experiments, it was at the 50 nanometer uh, scale, but they've been uh, improving the, the PEAM imaging um, to, to, that, to, that, to that scale. Um, I can give you the, there's also another XMCD effect, um, which you can do in transmission, which is at the 15 nanometer scale. Um, these are experiments that are done at light sources, which where you can get large numbers of, of circular polarized uh, photons. And it's never been a better time actually to be interested in micromagnetic structure because the, 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 the uh, techniques are improving uh, remarkably, actually. As, as, and, and, and a lot of the uh, light sources now have facilities to do magnetic imaging. Uh, this, this picture shows actually some of the domain refinements, these, these spikes you see, the first domain spiking in from the boundaries. Of the, of the element in, in the key image. Okay, maybe I, I don't know. You can also, so um, if you have these very large systems, you have almost no hope of actually simulating the system. Mm -hmm. uh, but, so what we did actually is, is, is actually make small particles and, look, and do magnetic force microscopy and then compare it to micromagnetic simulations. So those are simulations of the, I'll tell you about the LOG equations with a, a form of the micromagnetic energy to see if we could predict and understand how these domains form and why you get different domain structures in different uh, field uh, configurations. Um, maybe I won't say too much about it, but we can capture some of the features that you see in the experiment through these kinds uh, of simulations. There's also, maybe you've seen also that you can make materials now which have very, very strong perpendicular magnetic anisotropy. So these are thin films where instead of the magnetization wanting to be in the plane, it wants to point perpendicular to the surface. 
Uh, and so now the short dimension is the, the film thickness. And again, you have, you're forcing the magnetization from something to, uh, to try to induce it in a near static energy. And you get these beautiful kind of uh, patterns, domain patterns in, in remnants, uh, where the light is up and the black is down. These are magneto optic images. So these are again based on the absorption of light. Uh, at this time, just at optical wavelengths. So this contrast is, is just an optical uh, contrast. And so uh, you can achieve situations like the icing model. And in these kind of situations, you can have very, very strong anisotropy. Uh, on the order, as I said, about 10 tesla. So you really have up or down domains or in this limit where Q uh, is very, very large. Uh, and, and there's been a great deal of, of studies of, of these kind of structures and domain movements and understanding the domains as, as, as interfaces moving in, in, the, in the medium to understand what are the these domain object, these objects are like the vortices in a superconductor. They can be pinned on certain types of defects, and they 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 move in some landscape that's determined by by the by the, uh, by the, by the material, how the properties of the material vary. Um, and, we, and then there, we we published a paper on this on these kinds of materials recently. Uh, our interest is in actually trying to make very, very stable, very small structures. So we're starting with films like this and patterning them down in size to, to try to make very small uh, s single domain uh, magnetic uh, particles. Okay, so that was my kind of overview of, of the energy of, of, the micro of, of magnetic systems, of classical energy. And now I'm going to talk about single magnetic domains and also about the description, how we describe the dynamics uh, of domains. Um, and uh, this is a, uh, a picture uh, of, of the kinds of uh, physics you see at different length scales, uh, uh, which was uh, taken from uh, an article by Wolfgang Bernsdorfer, um, which shows the length scales from spins, some, from nearly Avogadro's number of spins down to one spin. For the scales I was talking about, uh, the, the physics is nucleation of, do of reverse domains and their propagation and anni annihilation of domain walls. So you'll, if you measure hysteresis, you'll see some ragged hysteresis curves or smooth hysteresis curves that reflect these nucleation and propagation of domain walls. If you go down to this, this scale, on the scale of the exchange length of uh, the material, you get close, you get into this single domain limit where you have uh, sharp jumps in the magnetization, which uh, corresponds to the switching of the magnetization direction. And when you get down to the very, very small scale, which I'll tell you about in the third lecture, you, um, you get into a regime where the finite spin makes a difference. And then you can you no longer you have a continuum of, of possible projections of the magnetization. You have a finite number, and that shows up in the magnetization hysteresis loop as steps in the magnetization of particular uh, magnetic fields. And, and that's evidence for quantum tunneling, which I'll, I'll talk about. Okay, so let's go here to a situation which presumably should be very simple. That is, we have a magnetization of a small particle, and we just wanted to be able, we think we can describe it just in terms of its angles, uh, the angles in which it forms. And this is the famous single domain model. It was written down in 1946, or someone by Stoner and Wolfart. Um, they, they, they said, they, let's just take the magnetization to depend on the direct, the energy depend on the direction of magnetization. So there's an anisotropy, preferred direction. Uh, so we'll take it to the z direction, and we apply, and there's a magnetic field. So this is the energy surface uh, in a zero applied field. We have a minimum at the north and south poles, and an energy barrier uh, separating those minimum. The, en minimum, the, en the, the energy barrier is related, uh, is set by the anisotropy. So it's set either by because you have some shape to the particle, which is not symmetric, um, so by dipole interaction, or because there's the orbit interactions that are um, going to favor a particular uh, direction. So this is our geometry. We're going to, if you apply the field at some angle, uh, it's straightforward to determine uh, when a metastable state becomes unstable. And that's a good exercise uh, to do. We find that it's, it's related uh, to the angles the field is applied. Where the, if there's a characteristic field that comes out, that's called the anisotropy field. This is the field scale that if, if you applied the field along a hard direction, along x or y, it would be the field at which the two minimum merge. And you just have one minimum, a minimum to the energy. 
So the, the curve that describes the, the, uh, the uh, metastability is, is this. It's an asteroid. Uh, Hx to the 2 thirds Hy, Hz to the 2 thirds equals 1. And so this is the boundary. Um, in, at boundary, you have two metastable states, and outside, you only have one stable state. You have one stable, at least one stable, one unstable state. Uh, and outside, you just have a stable state. Um, and uh, so this is known as the macro spin model or the Stone and Wolfgang model. If you measure the magnetization, of, so along the field direction, you'll see their jumps. If the field is along the easy axis, along Z, there's a jump when H is equal to this Anasaki field. When the field is along the hard axis, there's just there's no there's no jump. The magnetization varies continuously. Uh, and for intermediate angles, you have jumps at different fields given by this, by this, by this line. Um, so uh, actually, in, in magnetism, there was something known as the Brown, Brown's paradox. The fact is, even when, whenever you measured that small particles, you never, you never achieved, you could measure the anisotropy mm -hmm. by saturating the sample along the hard direction. And when you looked at switching, you always found the magnetization switches at much, much lower fields than predicted by this model, which indicates this model is not really describing the physics. So it's interesting that it, only in 1996, about 15 years after this model was was, uh, was, was first written down, uh, there was a study that showed that there was a sample that exhibited this uh, stone of uh, behavior, this single domain part of the uh, study. This was an experiment on an individual cobalt nanoparticle, um, which was three nanometers in size. So this is a picture, a TEM picture of really a two to force experiment because it was a study of an individual particle, this scale. And uh, this shows the, the measured uh, switching uh, field for various angles of the field on a one second time scale for various temperatures. So the lowest temperature is 40 uh, millikelvin, and you see something that's very close to what we would expect of the map. Oh, HSW, that's the zero temperature switching field. That's so the zero means, thanks for, thank you for that question. That's the zero, it means that this is the switching field at zero temperature. This is the field at which the metastable state becomes unstable. And um, so SW means stone or wolf art. This stands for stone or wolf art. Are there other questions? Stoner Wolf Art. What sort of geometry is that? The particle is, so the particle was placed randomly on a, on a squid magnetometer, mm -hmm. and then the field was changed in different directions to find easy on the hard axis. Mm -hmm. And this is a cut in that, in the perpendicular to the easy direction. Or in the easy hard plane, sorry. In the easy hard plane. So just a, a cut really. So you, the experiment is, was, it was you, you sprinkle magnetic particles on your detector and you hope that one lands on it. And then if you're, if you're lucky enough to have one land on your detector, you study it for months and months and months to get this, uh, this, this, uh, this picture. Um, so what was unique about the experiment was that one particle was measured but, and, the, and the sensitivity existed. And also it was done at extremely low temperature so that uh, the particle is very small. You're, you're at very, very low temperature. So you're approaching the zero temperature uh, behavior. Because you see now, if you heat up the, if the sample, if the particle goes up to 12 degrees Kelvin, this, this, this asteroid shrinks because you're further this was another, this was the first example of the Neil Brown model, which says that the probability of switching should just take up exponentially on the, on the temperature, and the waiting time to go exponentially is the energy barrier over kT. So the probability of not switching should be an exponential, e to the minus t over tau. Um, and this shows, this, this diagram here, so as you can see, this shows the waiting time measurements, the probability of not switching at various uh, various magnetic fields close to the switching boundary, close to this switching boundary, time flows 1 to 100 uh, seconds, 
I guess. And this is the mean uh, of the switching time versus the weight, the field at which you're sitting. And based on this model, this is the expected scaling. This is the, uh, of, the, of the data if beta is 3 halves. Uh, beta is 3 halves if the field is not along any of the principal directions, if it's not along the z direction, for example. This was the first example of uh, of single domain behavior, <coughs> and it shows you have to go to very, very small sizes to achieve this. As soon as you have a particle that's double this, you don't see this behavior. Um, it just forms domains again. Yeah, it just starts. Well, I think you, you'll talk about this tomorrow here, right? About the nucleation yeah. and, uh, and propagation. When as soon as you have any kind of anything approach, even approaching these two times the exchange, like you have nucleation phenomena. So this is about 200 or so for what at least here. Let's see, so let's see, let's see, you said, let's see, I said it's a 3 nanometer particle, right, so we should take 3, um, so it's, yes, it's about 15 cubed. So I was just, yeah. Oh, so you're just looking at a slice. You have to also consider that the, the, these are rows of that. Right, so it's not a single. Yeah. So if, if, if it gets much smaller, then you have to worry more about quantum. Yes, you have to worry. In fact, the motivation for these experiments was to see quantum effects. They too large, too large mm-hmm. for most part. <coughs> I mean, at very low temperatures, you can do what? I just did not. So you know, yes. 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 yes, it's, it's it, it was a huge effort to get a, a system which fits the system. So, it, so it shows that we need more complex models to understand real systems. So this is what you would have expected if it were. Uh, if, this is what you expect now if you have thermal activation on the barrier that the relaxation rate should go exponentially as u over k t. Um, and uh, so this is what was seen in this experiment, that you had this relation satisfied. Um, but in 1998, it was proposed that there, and, and just before, and in the 1980s, I should say, it was proposed that there could be quantum dynamics of the magnetization. Um, these were the groups that proposed it. Enzim Schilling, and Martin and Soto, and Janowski and Gunther. Uh, and they said, well, there, there should be some kind of quantum relaxation. Uh, that is, there should be a possibility of tunneling directly through the barrier without borrowing thermal energy, uh, and that should show up as a temperature-independent rate. So you should have a situation where the rate just goes as some factor that depends on the barrier and the action uh, under that, uh, uh, that in the inverted potential, I guess. Uh, and, and this would give you then a, a, a temperature at which you would cross over to a temperature independent behavior. So the relaxation rate would be exponential and then uh, would, would be a constant uh, independent temperature. And this work actually prompted the kinds of experiments I showed you and also prompted a lot of work on magnetic particle arrays uh, the, to, to look for temperature independent relaxation. Uh, the main difficulty for the experiment was as soon as you have an array, you have distributions in the particle properties. So you have variations in the number of atoms in a particle, the anisotropy, and so on, and that masks a lot of this behavior because as a function of temperature, you're sampling different parts of that distribution. Uh, it is, it is uh, not possible to see clearly this crossover to one. So in the last few minutes, then, I'm going to talk just about classical magnetization dynamics. Um, and how you describe uh, the classical dynamics. Um, But what you do is you consider uh, an effective field, an effective field that results from all of these interactions that go into the micromagnetic energy. It's the variational derivative of the energy with respect to magnetization. So that gives you a preferred uh, direction for the magnetization. This this also can depend on direction, et cetera. and uh, for just for an example, if you if you in a single domain model, the effective field would be the applied field plus a, a field associated with the anisotropy that says if the magnetization is up and mz is plus one, stay up. If the magnetization is down, that mag- field is down, uh, keep magnetized down. So this is uh, the way you describe it. And then you just write out Lewis' laws that says that the change in angular momentum is equal to the torque on the magnetization, or m cross the, the effective magnetic field. Um, and if you consider that the angular momentum is related to the magnetization by the gyromagnetic ratio, um, you have an equation for the magnetization 
like this, which says the MDT equals uh, M cross H effective. So it says the, the, the dynamics of a moment is precession. So if it's displaced from equilibrium, the magnetization will precess about the, 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 about the effective field. Um, and uh, the rate of precession will be determined by the effective field. So you'll have a, tra a transverse component uh, that processes in this single domain, uh, in the single domain model, and it just processes forever. Um, and uh, well, it was realized that we, you know, we also know that magnets come to equilibrium, that we need something else to actually describe uh, how, we, how things, how the magnet actually relaxes, how you get to the MDT equals zero. And uh, that was first introduced uh, by, well, this, this equation was first introduced by Lando and Richards, and they also introduced a form of the damping, uh, some dissipation. This is actually, the, I've written down the Gilbert form of the dissipation, which is a viscous dissipation, which says that magnetization decays at a rate determined by its rate of change um, of, of, of a moment. So alpha is the, is the dimensionless uh, dissipation. It's a, uh, and, and this is a uh, this, so this this is a this is m cross the rate of change um, of, of dissipation and, and Landau Lipschitz wrote down the dissipation as a as a lambda m cross m cross h effective. So in the small alpha limit, these guys are essentially those are essentially equivalent. So what does this say? Well, if, you, if you're in equilibrium, the magnetization is along the uh, effective field. You keep pointing that direction. If you're away from equilibrium, you process. But the, but the MDT, this alpha the MDT causes the precession to relax toward the equilibrium uh, direction. So that's the simplest model. This is a phenomenological model. So up to, up to here, you can understand this as, as resulting from, from the equations of motion. Uh, this is just putting in what's the third, what can you imagine that will cause dissipation. So alpha is, in fact, a pretty poorly understood uh, quantity. Uh, you need it to understand experiments. Uh, where it comes from microscopically depends very much on the materials, and also it's uh, it's 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 uh, uh, you could say it's it's just it's, it can be determined phenomenologically, and in some cases you can understand the origin of the dissipation. Um, you could drive the system also; it's a resonant system, so it, if it will if you put it in a, a, a an RF magnetic field that's at the at the frequency of the natural precession, it will resonate. Um, and, you, it's, and you can maintain that precession, and that's a way to, to basically measure the effective field and to determine the forces acting on your on the magnetic moment. Um, here's a, even an animation. Uh, so, so where does the barrier come from? Where is the barrier? Where is the barrier in this expression? The, the, the barrier comes in through this through this H effective. This H effective um, depends on the magnetization direction. So you can think about this, if for small angle precession, you can think about it just as an oscillation in the bottom of the, of the well. Um, and uh, if you want to understand uh, the problem of thermal activation, you have to put noise into this expression. You have to put in the coupling to the environment. So uh, uh, okay, under this, this so we're, we're imagining a very, a very low T, above below the ordering temperature, and it's common uh, then to assume the magnetization is fixed, but can just fluctuate in direction. And uh, to, to, to describe thermal activation, you have to put in uh, you, you can put in the random field. Uh, yeah. Where is the barrier? Where is the barrier? Um, the, the barrier comes in through. This is the derivative of the energy with respect to magnetization. So uh, the dynamics is determined where you by by where's the barrier in this uh, in expression. This is, uh, I guess. Okay, this describes the dynamics, and this, this is the energy of the system. I'm not sure I can get this with your question. It's not terms in the only So it's all in the It's all in, it's lumped into that H effective, and the fact that that H effective in this single domain case depends on the magnetization direction. So, so here the content here is not a content. Here is. Omega zero. Omega zero. Omega zero. Right. Omega zero, this will not be a constant, right? It, it will depend on the precession amplitude. That's exactly that's correct. So for small deviations, it's it's a good approximation. 
for large deviations, you have nonlinear effects. You have, it's a highly nonlinear problem, actually. The, the reversal is a highly nonlinear problem. But if you, so at close to what if the precession angle is small, say a degree or so, then it's, then you could, then you have, then this is a good approximation. That's a that's an excellent question. I mean, in fact, that's that's a research question actually. That's a topic that's being explored. Uh, in, in, that's that's a topic that's being explored. Um, Mostly we know alpha from very small, from experiments with very small angle dynamics. Um, and, it's all, and, and now we're seeing that, but, but in many cases we want to switch the magnetization so we have large angle dynamics. So you don't expect alpha to be independent of the amplitude of, 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 the, of the motion. Um, you expect actually this, I mean, you expect this to be just the leading order uh, Terms and that and you, you, you might then and there are different you know uh, there are different ways of trying to get at this one there's a phenomenological way people say well the alpha, the alpha itself has depends on the magnetization so it's not linear or you can try to get alpha microscopically and see how it depends on the on the uh, on magnetization direction um, there are papers by Slavin just a few years ago. Uh, that say that alpha has to be nonlinear, otherwise you get <coughs> unphysical results, unphysical behavior of a magnetic moment. So, uh, if you want to look up some of the ideas there, you should look at look for Slavin. Uh, just a few years ago, he describes one form of the damping, the nonlinear damping. <coughs> Oops. Oops. Actually, I was pretty much finished with my talk, actually. Uh, but I'll, I'll leave, let's see, what else did I want to tell you? Um, oh, I wanted to tell you, basically, you could probe this. It'll, it'll come on eventually. It'll come on. Um, us New Yorkers just like to talk. That's why it's probably... Uh, it, it's, uh, so I was going to tell you, you can probe, I was going to show you ferromagnetic resonance, you can see that in, in the notes, that, uh, that you can, you see a very nice absorption when the, when you, when you apply RF, you either sweep the frequency at a fixed field, or you apply a constant frequency when you sweep the magnetic field, you see a nice absorption, and you can use that to measure the energetics yet the form of the anisotropy of the magnet. You typically do that in a large field, so it's a good approximation to assume that the magnetization is uniform in, um, in, in size, uh, in scale. So it's just uniform across the sample. Let's see, what else did I have in there? Um, okay, I was going to show that the, well, if you, I was gonna, you'll see in that graph there's a variety of things superposed, but the line width gives you the dissipation of your system. Ah, there it goes. It's coming back. Okay. So this shows you what a typical uh, absorption experiment would give you. Uh, this is the loss versus applied field. Um, at a fixed microwave frequency, you apply a small AC field that's perpendicular, uh, usually to the main uh, applied field. Uh, and you see, um, this is the typical scale. We're talking about microwaves, so internal fields in a ferromagnet associated with anisotropy and applied field or the order of Tesla. So you have 28 gigahertz per Tesla. That gives you the rough scale uh, of the phenomena. These are these are my, these are scales of, of, of microwaves. So these are these kinds of materials that are interest for microwave devices or oscillators. Um, and this shows the kind of. Do you have a question? If you, this shows the kind of absorption you see uh, at a particular frequency. You'll see a nice absorption with the line width. Uh, gives you the uh, is related to alpha. And if you looked at the line width as a function of frequency, that that uh, slope will give you alpha. Okay, I'm not going to say too much about this. This is these are experiments we do. So this is probing just the energetics of the magnet, the derivative of the um, of the magnetization with respect to angle. 
Um, so you can get information by changing the angle of the, by changing the angle of the applied field. You can get information on the energy surface of your of your magnet. Um, and the Landau Richards Gilbert equation, I'll just say, also describes these uniform excitations. It also can describe uh, a spin wave excitation. Classical, these are, these are excitations that pictorially look like this, where the phase of the magnetization varies uh, as, you, as you traverse the sample. Um, so, uh, one of the neat things, I guess, is that uh, you could have a very non-trivial dispersion relation. You might expect, since you have this exchange A rad M squared, that it would just go as Q, the, the dispersion would go as Q squared, and uh, the lowest energy uh, spin waves would be very long wave spin waves. But for these thin films, actually, because of these nasty dipole interactions, uh, when the magnetization is processing in the plane of the film, you can have lower energy spin waves at finite k, um, and that's, you can have a, a dispersion where the omega decay is negative, uh, and, and then and reaches a minimum. And this is associated with the fact that, that the dipole interactions prefer that the magnetization processes out of phase in different parts of the, of the, of the material. Um, and so you can have actually, first of all, low energy excitation of the paramagnet that's not uniform, and then you also, this mode that you would excite in an FMR experiment is degenerate with spin wave modes that are in finite case. That leads to various, uh, lots of interesting phenomena uh, that puzzles us and keeps us busy in trying to understand uh, ferromagnets. So this is what I've covered uh, so far. So I've told you about magnetic interactions. There's a hierarchy of energy scales. There's exchange on isotropy and dipole. Where thankfully, these scales are often separated so we can go down and write down effective Hamiltonians or energies uh, that take into account the main effects. Uh, there's, there's, there's the micromagnetic energy I told you. I told you about the single domain model, which has been sort of the starting point for understanding uh, uh, many uh, ferromagnets. Um, uh, there's now experiments on individual classical uh, nanomagnets. You can expect transitions between thermal activation and quantum tunneling. I've shown you the basic equation, which is the landau lipschitz gilbert equation. And t tomorrow, we'll add a new term to that equation that's not associated with magnetic fields, but associated with, with electron spins. And I briefly mentioned ferromagnetic resonance. And these are some of the texts that, that, that have the kinds of material I've told you about. Uh, there's a nice introduction to classical magnetism by Aaroni. Uh, which talks about the, the micromagnetism and, and the LRG equation. There's a new book by uh, Chernovsky and Tahada, uh, which is more quantum in its approach, starting with spin Hamiltonians. It's a very short book, small book, so it, it, it kind of has highlights in it. There's also a set of problems in that book which are uh, solved. Uh, there's, there's a second volume which has problems in magnetism. Um, and there's an awful lot that's been done on magnetic domains, on various types of magnetic domains and magnetic stability that you can have. There's a book by Hubert and Schaefer, which is like a catalog of all the types of domains you can form in various types of materials. Uh, it's, it's really kind of beautiful. And if you look at it, it's kind of like what you see when you look, look at liquid crystals, all the possible phases uh, of form. Um, this was, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty up to date in that it, it, co it covers much of the, what's known about high anisotropy, low anisotropy uh, materials. And it's a very beautiful book, so you can just sit there and open it and look at all the beautiful pictures and maybe come up with ideas for uh, what, what experimentalists should look at in these materials associated with their mind delivery and behavior. So thank you. Put in a noise term, actually, a fluctuating field, so you could like to, to understand. You would need that uh, to, have to, to, to describe systems at finite, finite temperature. So uh, you need to have a noise term that's particularly important to describing the thermal activation. So you need to have a noise to in order to achieve.
achieve certain things. There is, of course, you should put a random field into these models if you want to describe uh, system climate And just to follow up on the question, can you measure the correlation function like the two time correlation function experimentally? Um, can you measure the two-time correlation? So that would be the spin, mm -hmm. spin yeah. correlation function. You can look at magnetic fluctuations. So you can look at magnetic fluctuations of time series of magnetic fluctuations. Um, so that, that I believe that you can measure that. Uh, there, there are different. I mean, there are ways to do that. I mean, in, on individual magnets, you can do it uh, even in a transport experiment, where you would where you would use the fact that the Magnetization direction reduces an observable change in resistance to look at the minimums. Um, we need to think about other ways to get at the, the, the noise spectrum. Um, there's, there's the thermally induced fMR. There's the thermally right. You could just let us. So, by, we're looking here. That's a thank you, Tom. Um, Tom Silva, if you don't know him, he's your neighbor five minutes away, I believe. Uh, in this, uh, and an expert on magnetism and, and the dynamics. So what I've showed you is that this FMR is a measurement of the susceptibility. Um, so you're putting in a small AC field and looking at the, at the response at, the, at that frequency. You can equally well just uh, let the sample sit and fluctuate and look at the, at the noise and, and, and find, find basically the same kinds of, uh, of information. Should the noise and the should you just add that on? Should it be in the same effect? Um, it's usually added as a, as a, as a, uh, a random field with Gaussian uh, distribution. Yeah, just so it's added in. To, it added, added plus, it's a term added H effective plus H noise. So it's multiplied the end. Yes, it's multiplying the M because in this formulation, you assume M is constant. The M the magnetization length doesn't change. Only, so you only have transverse fluctuations. Fluctuations transverse to M. Mm -hmm. so, so it's not just M noise, it's noise and M. Yes, it's H plus the noise term. I can show you what that is. Okay. In certain simplifying coordinates and geometries, you can end up with an equation of motion in which the thermal fluctuation term is simply the additive noise. But it's specialized geometries, and generally it's multiplicative. Mm -hmm. This uh, dimension is parameter alpha. How does it change from, let's say, you have a large chunk of iron and a thin film? And what are the typical values? So typical values are 0 0.01 to 100. I think the smallest value ever measured is 10 to the minus 5. That would be a magnetic insulator, uh, like, uh, like YIG. YIG. But is it, does it like vary a lot if you shrink? Or how does it change with size of your system? Um, at the scale of these nanometer scale particles, it, it, it's not a big, it's not a strong, it doesn't appear to be strong function of the size. So down to scales of, on the scale of the exchange length. So I should say, we're talking, it, depends on the, I mean, it, it, it depends on the mechanisms of dissipation. In the metal, you have a Fermi seal. So you have excitations. The, direct, the motion of the magnetization creates excitations in the Fermi seal, which leads to dissipation. In insulators, there's no Fermi seal. There's coupling between the spin and the lattice. So it's a spin order coupling. Um, and, and so that, those situations are different. You could expect that when you get a metal down to the scale where you have discrete levels, you'll have a big change in, in the dissipation. But at the scale of nanometers, you're talking about a very fine level spacing of the particles. And, and uh, that so should that increase if you shrink the size? Well, if you got down to the discrete levels, I, would, I might expect alpha to decrease, mm -hmm. yes, when you get down to very, very small sizes. Um, alpha. Uh, can you go to the slide of uh, in wave? In wave. Uh, here in, 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 this, in this figure, when k uh, goes to zero, the omega does not vanish. 
So it, yes. indic it, it indicates that uh, this spin wave is not an, an elastic mode. It's not an elastic, you mean not an acoustic kind of, not a... Yeah, no, because it, it, this is still with the elastic mode. Then. Yes, yes, the reason it doesn't go to zero is anisotropy. So that you don't have isotrop isotropy space. That's, so anisotropy is why you have this, uh, this non-zero uh, frequency. So only the anisotropic term can be spread this. Yes, you have to break the isotropy of space to have this kind of behavior. It can be dipole or anisotropy, I guess, anything that can break the... So you need more than exchange, let's say. Isotropic exchange. Where is that minimum? Is that a special point in terms of lattice symmetry or uh, the minimum? The oh, where is that minimum? That's a, uh, that minimum uh, is, is, it will depend on lots of uh, details of your system, basically. Uh, it's, it's, it's not, it depends on, on the, mag it's, it's a dipole effect, it depends on the magnetization density and the geometry. As well as the, so it depends actually I think on everything of the, all the terms that come into the into the micromagnetic expression into the that broke down. But is it does it generally couple to the lattice so that there is a special special mm -hmm. wave vector sort of? Uh, um, so this is actually not even this is uh, this is not even associated in some sense with the there's no direct coupling to the lattice. I mean the coupling. This is associated with, essentially, I believe that all you need is dipole interactions in a thin layer. So you need no, you can have no anisotropy and you would have a minimum in this, in this energy. You don't need that, it's, the critical ingredients are the, the, the dipole term and the exchange. Well, but, but if you had, you just said that if you had no anisotropy, the minimum would be at zero wave number, right? Oh, right, if I, right. Yeah, I that's what a, I mean, what, what wave number is it? What wave number is this at? That the, uh, if, so if, if I had no anisotropy, this I could pull this down. But of course, if I have, a, I can also pull it up if I break, if I break the symmetry of the sample somehow. But in general, I, I, I guess there's no, there's no easy answer. It depends on all the parameters of the magnetic system, all of the, the interplay between exchange, exchange anisotropy, and dipole. The, the non-local nature of the dipole field is critical for that to happen. And so film thickness affects where that point is. But it really doesn't have anything to do with crystals and uh, the anisot I mean, in magnetics, we toss around anisotropy rather cavalier. We can mean both crystalline or shape. Because they have ultimately experimentally the same effect in terms yes. of uh, giving a preferred orientation to the magnetization. That's right. That's basically. They're, these are the kind you can. This is in some cases. It's basically, if you have a thin film, you can basically treat that to the first approximation as, as a system of easy plane anisotropy. If it's a, if it's a material which doesn't have, which is, is soft, which doesn't have large spin orbit coupling, large preferred direction due to the crystal. So if you just take a garden variety material, say a polycrystalline material, or you can even take an amorphous material you would still get a, a term that, that looks like a, an anisotropy that that's basically goes as some, in, in the case of would go as, uh, energy would go as some constant times mc squared. So that, and, but um, to, what Tom is saying is that in, in that situation, it's still the case that these long wave major and dipole interactions could give you a lower energy uh, spin wave for a particular wave vector. Any further questions? If not, let's thank this.